Hey guys, welcome to the most exciting video I've ever made, in my opinion. Earlier this year, I asked anybody with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, Hypermobility Spectrum Disorder, or Benign Joint Hypermobility Syndrome to fill out a survey, and I had over 600 people fill it out, which is crazy. It's way more than I expected. Thank you so much. Over the last few months, I analyzed this data partially with the help of my professor, Dr. Antonio Herrera. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the survey results as well as the analysis. And we're also going to compare it to the known data on people with these conditions. So let's get to it. Over 650 people filled out the survey, but I ended up excluding any duplicates. And I also excluded anybody who had more than one type of EDS, which was very few people. So in total, I ended up with 606 participants. Baton score. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a test for hypermobility. You'll see that it is the first part of the criteria in hypermobile EDS, and it really just tests for hypermobility. And a lot of people who don't have EDS are very hypermobile, but um, with EDS, we're more likely to be hypermobile. The most common Baton score of my audience uh, was a Baton score of seven. When I broke this down into the average Baton score for each type of EDS, you can see here that there are some differences between the different types. And I ended up actually highlighting any group that had more than 10 participants. So that's what you'll see in red and you'll see that a bit throughout the study. So we're gonna be looking at those types of EDS. You can see that on average, people with classical EDS and people with HSD actually had the highest Baton score, they were actually the exact same Baton score, which was a 7.64 average. Hypermobile EDS had a Baton score of 7.225. And then what's really interesting is that those diagnosed with benign joint hypermobility syndrome had a significantly lower Baton score than the others. Um, their average was 6.58. Now, one of the reasons that I can think of for why that would be much lower is that actually the diagnostic criteria for benign joint hypermobility syndrome um, only requires that somebody have a um, four on the Baton score, whereas AGDS requires a five five or six, depending on your age. And in limited circumstances, um, you can get one point lower. So it makes sense. Also, it's important to say that um, benign joint hypermobility syndrome is an outdated diagnosis in the US. Um, now people who have benign joint hypermobility syndrome will likely either fall um, into the category of some sort of EDS or hypermobility spectrum disorder. If you wanna learn more about that and the differences between HSD, EDS, benign joint hypermobility syndrome, just regular hypermobility, check out this video in the corner um, that I made a while back, dislocations. As you can see, the shoulder was the most common joint that has fully dislocated. I also asked about subluxations. I've not included that in this video, only full dislocations. Overall, 38% of participants had dislocated a shoulder. 18% had dislocated an ankle, 27% a patella, which is the kneecap. That is what, um, yeah, that's my bad one. 31% um, had dislocated a finger, 25% um, a hip. Oh, that sounds bad. 15.7% a rib. 18% jaw, 20% wrist, and then 9% shoulder blade. And then I wanted to see if um, certain types of dislocations were more common in certain types of EDS. And actually there were no statistically significant differences between the um, types of EDS. So that's very interesting to hear that maybe on a more external hypermobility dislocation level, uh, the types of EDS resemble each other potentially. I don't know for sure, I'm just, just saying at least resemble the types of joints dislocated. POTS. Out of every single person in the study, we had a 60% POTS positivity rate, I guess you could say. Um, so that means 60% of people who took the survey had POTS. That is so many people. Most studies say that um, around 40 to 60% of people with EDS have POTS, though I've actually seen studies where up to 80% of people have POTS. So um, I don't really know what the real statistic is. You could see that the frequency of POTS in people with classical, hypermobile, and unspecified types of EDS were much higher than in BJH and HSD, which is very, very interesting. It's really interesting to see how there's such a difference um, in POTS levels between those with EDS and those with um, very similar conditions. And um, it makes me wonder, um, why that is and you know it's so important to bring up the conversation of 
Is HSD the exact same thing as HEDS or the exact same thing as another type of EDS? And the truth is that um, obviously there are people who are diagnosed with HSD who actually have a type of EDS. That's totally obvious, but I wonder if people who do not have POTS are less likely to get the diagnosis of HEDS even when they fit the criteria, or maybe when they come close to fitting the criteria. If a doctor says, well, you're basically fit the criteria, but you have all these other comorbid conditions, maybe they're more likely to just say, you know what, it's quite obviously EDS. So that's just a possibility, but I don't actually know. Chronic pain spots. Here is a graph of the overall frequency by EDS group um, for each pain spot that I listed as an option. You can see that the types of EDS tend to follow along with each other. They follow the same trend. So where a certain pain spot is high in one type of EDS, it tends to be high in most other types of EDS. Some of the very common pain spots were the knee, the ankle, the hip, the shoulder slash shoulder blade, and then wrist and neck. All of these are very large joints, so it's interesting to see how there's more pain in those joints versus some of the smaller joints, such as the fingers and the SI joints. When you look at what most studies say, most of them have found that the most painful spots are the shoulders, hands, hips, knees, spine, and feet slash toes. So I'd say this lines up pretty well with what we're expecting. Now here is where the most exciting part of the study comes in, in my opinion, just because I found some really cool results. Many of you have probably heard that autism and EDS sometimes go together. So um, people with EDS are more likely to have autism than the general population, but it's not considered a comorbidity. And honestly, I don't really know if you would use like comorbidity as the correct language for autism anyway. In a study conducted in 2018, they found that 2.9% of people with EDS have autism. In the general population, only about 1.85% of people have autism. So you can see that there is an increase, it was statistically significant, um, but it's not, it, it's nothing too drastic. Well, hold up. I cannot believe what my like survey showed. It's honestly crazy. In general, 17% of people who took this survey said that they have autism, but it gets even more interesting. First of all, that is dramatically higher than any study I could find uh, talking about how common autism is in EDS. Now, if you look at autism frequency um, by the type of EDS, you'll see something so cool. 21.4% of people with classical EDS had autism but only 12.6% of people with HEDS had autism, and the difference between those two was statistically significant. People who had an unspecified type of EDS, 40% of them had autism. So I was trying to think it through, you know, do I, do I ever talk about autism? I don't have autism, so it's not like it's ever been a video topic. So I don't see why there'd be any reason that people who have EDS and autism would be more likely to click on my videos than people who have EDS without autism. So I don't know. I'm sure that they, there has to be some explanation, but uh, that's really high and that is so interesting. You could see that the most common comorbidities were POTS, Chronic pain, if you really consider that a comorbidity, I don't know, but I threw it in there just in case. Um, abdominal pain, same thing, comorbidity, kind of. Um, and then TMJD and headaches. So in total, here were the stats. 60% of people had POTS. 22% of people had gastroparesis. 86% had chronic pain. Think about how large that number is. Luckily, only 1.3% of people have ever had an aortic aneurysm or dissection, um, which is so great. Obviously, my my audience is much younger than the average uh, like person <laughs> because I'm only 23, and most of my audience is between the ages of 18 and 24, though I do have quite a wide distribution. So therefore, most people who filled out the survey are relatively young, if not very young. So um, that's just one really important thing I should say. So 39% had TMJ, dysfunction, 12.5% craniocervical instability, 2.8% Chiari malformation, 21% MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome, 68% had abdominal pain, 80% had headaches, 17% had autism, 
0.5% oh, had blood vessel ruptures, thank goodness, um, like major blood vessel ruptures, 12% had prolapses, 43% had IBS, and 88% had fatigue. Those last two I did not include in this graph. There's actually so many more that I didn't include. I just picked some of the ones I thought were interesting. So one study that I was looking at found that in HEDS, 55% of people had abdominal pain and 63% had headaches. So for both of those categories, they were a bit higher in like my, my survey sample. People click on my videos probably because they have a certain level of severity of EDS. Some people have EDS and it's not that bad for them. So maybe they don't really care to look for sources of support such as on YouTube. Also, people are more likely to click on my videos if it's on a topic of like a comorbidity that they have. So um, keep that in mind. So therefore like my survey sample is more likely to resemble my conditions. So I found that 22% of people who filled out the survey have had at least one orthopedic surgery. And obviously that number is really high, but it's actually quite lower than what you see if you look up the percent of people who've had orthopedic surgery with different types of EDS um, in studies. One of them found that 46.6% of people with EDS have had orthopedic surgery. With gastroparesis, um, I found something that's very similar to what we found in POTS, which is that people who had a type of EDS uh, had a higher frequency of this condition than people who had benign joint hypermobility syndrome and HSD. In total, 30% of participants had gastroparesis, which is just so many. I was not expecting it to be that high. But compared to how common it is in EDS, that is much lower, and it was a statistically significant difference. I also found something so interesting about prolapses. In total, 12.12% of people have had a prolapse, at least one, um, but between the different groups, there was quite a difference. Classical EDS, 7% of people have had a prolapse. With hypermobile EDS, 16%. With HSD, 0%. So zero of the 43 people have had a prolapse. And benign joint hypermobility, only 2% of people. And then when you look at unspecified types of EDS, 28%. So you can see that in the hypermobile type of EDS and in unspecified types of EDS, there was such a higher frequency of prolapses and especially compared to HSD and BJH, like, wow. So it really makes me start to wonder if there's a difference between HSD and EDS or more like, is there a difference in the populations of people who are diagnosed with HSD and the people who are diagnosed with EDS? Because like I've said before, there are definitely people who have HSD who are diagnosed with HSD who actually have EDS. Um, but if not everybody um, who has HSD has EDS, I don't know. But um, And maybe it's all just that those people are less likely to fit the diagnostic criteria and the people who are less likely to fit the diagnostic criteria are also less likely to have prolapses and some of the, and POTS and gastroparesis, you know, or maybe they're just less likely to get diagnosed with those because even if they fit the criteria, maybe a doctor says, well, you don't have any comorbidities or you don't have enough or something like that, I don't know. Um, but it's it really should bring up an interesting conversation. MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome. So in total, 21% of people had MCAS. Um, that is just so many, wow. There was also a huge difference between EDS types and benign joint hypermobility syndrome and HSD. Classical EDS, 21% of people had MCAS. HEDS, 27% of people had MCAS. And then 44% of people with unspecified EDS had MCAS versus 9% with HSD and 2% with BJH. Again, it makes me wonder some more about, is it just the people who pass the diagnostic criteria are less likely to have these conditions or do they actually have something that is say, actually just another type of EDS or like another connective tissue disorder, you know what I mean? Now I have so much more information on other types of comorbidities and chronic pain spots, dislocation locations, <laughs> Um, and I can totally do a video on those, but I didn't want to flood this video with the boring statistics. I wanted this to be a conversation and statistics. 
Um, and hopefully you found this interesting. If you want another video on this and this video does well, then I will totally do another video with some of the other information that I collected. But hopefully you found this informative and you found this interesting and it sparked some conversation about um, the ways in which different types of EDS, HSD, um, can actually be different. And um, I'm sure I'm totally going to get a lot of comments about, uh, I'm confused, what's the difference between benign joint hypermobility syndrome and HSD? And is there really a difference between HSD and EDS? And I've answered that. Um, again in that video i talked about in the beginning um so if you have that question please do look at that video um and then if you have any more questions ask me totally happy happy to uh chat about that please comment down below your thoughts um and if you enjoyed this video thanks so much for watching and i'll see you guys on the next one bye